for real deterrence and defense, we would like to have NATO presence in our states. We are working in our case in Lithuania, there is German-led battalion, Canada, and the UK is uh, for, for Latvian Estonians and working with them countries and also all the, uh, our NATO allies to strengthen that presence because we think only to the best deterrence is the good defense to prepare for the defense. So the, the NATO battalions, we want them to become the brigade and also US military troops on the ground. We do have now full-fledged combat ready US battalion in Lithuania. So, and we see that as the best, the best deterrence as well. Good evening, ambassadors um, and members of the diplomatic corps, World Boston community members, and everyone here and on Zoom. Uh, I'm Mary Eintema, president and CEO of World Boston, and it is a pleasure to welcome you to the sixth annual State of the State Department program at the Boston Public Library. As always, we thank the Lowell Institute, which helped found and generously supports the State of the State Department series, uh, which makes it free of charge to the public. We are so honored uh, to start off this program with our group of distinguished guests. Audra Plapitia, Ambassador of Lithuania. Uh, Kristen Prick, Ambassador of Estonia. Uh, and Mara Selga, Ambassador of Latvia to the United States. With our friend Ambassador Paula Dobriansky, a senior fellow at the Harvard Belfer Center and former Under Secretary of State for Global Affairs. And I have to point out that Ambassador Dobriansky really is one of ours because uh, at one time she was chair of the World Affairs Councils of America board. So, I was hoping you'd say that. Welcome right. back. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so we have lots to cover in not enough time and therefore I'm not going to read the amazing bios of our speakers, but you can scan them on the QR code um, or at your leisure uh, at home. So I'm going to start um, by asking Ambassador Dobriansky to give us um, her overview, and then I will clear out, um, and um, she'll take the discussion from there until we go to questions. So, um, a very simple question for you. Um, can you give us your thoughts uh, from the point of view of U.S. national interests on the relation between the United States and um, the Baltic nations? Absolutely. Thank you. And I'm going to thank you, Mary. Let's give Mary a round of applause. I promise Mary I'm going to give a very brief answer to her question because we also we want definitely to hear from the three Baltic ambassadors to the United States. My answer to you is very specifically, first, the United States has had a long-standing and very close and supportive relationship with each of the Baltic countries and with the Baltic states as, 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 if I could say, as a unit, as a region. And it has especially become even closer from the State Department angle. I think all of you would notice and admit that when you look at the invasion of Ukraine, February 24 last year, the hard work that the Secretary of State has done in terms of solidifying a unity of purpose within the alliance and focus on the invasion of Ukraine. That's been a top priority for the State Department. And in that context, the Baltic states have been certainly front and center because you are on the front lines. And not only are you on the front lines, but you are able to give a perspective on what's happening economically, politically, militarily, and it has been of great value to us. So the view is this conversation today is exceedingly relevant because it matters, their view, not only as to what's happening now, but also what can be happening in the future. What are the ramifications, not just only for the Baltic states, 
but for uh, the uh, Atlantic community and transatlantic relations. And we're at a very critical juncture. So with that, if I may, I want to dive into my question uh, for all three of you. And we'll start with you, Audra, and we'll go down the line here. Could you each give your succinct perspective on how you see European security today from where you're sitting? Of obviously, Ukraine factors into that. There are other issues as well, but how do you see it? What are your concern, uppermost concerns? What's your perspective? Thank you very much and good evening. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here in, in this audience and on this so topical issue and thank you Paul for, for being with us. Yeah, European security landscape and situation is is very worsening and as you mentioned, I think we cannot speak about the European security without mentioning Ukraine. Ukraine is in the center of that, or to be very frank, not Ukraine, but Russian aggression against Ukraine, which started more than a year ago, which is a full-scale military invasion, but we shouldn't forget that that was only one step. The war in Ukraine started in 2014 with annexation of Crimea and uh, the going on, war going on until the, in Donbass region, but before that, 2008, we had Georgia, and before that, uh, Chechnya, and ever so that we shouldn't forget. So how to support Ukraine? How to ensure its victory? and a defeat of Russia, strategic defeat of Russia, I think that is the main aims of today's our foreign policy and security policy, but also how to ensure and to strengthen the eastern flank of NATO. We hear President Biden saying that every inch of NATO territory will be defended, so we have to ensure that, that we have enough equipment, resources allocated to that as well. As well. And uh, to ensure accountability for the crimes of aggression against Ukraine, war crimes, I think no peace would be possible without accountability as well. Thank you. And by the way, they each gave me permission to call them by their first names. So forgive the informality, but I didn't want to trip over a last name. So, Maris, if you would, please. Yeah, thank you very much and good evening. So it's a really honor and pleasure to be here uh, in Boston, in World Boston as well. So that um, just to add what Audra said is, uh, I would probably say that we have to pay attention. I mean, Ukraine, war in Ukraine is, of course, one thing we have to pay attention to our neighboring country, Belarus. And uh, let's not forget about uh, this interesting uh, region in Kaliningrad, which is uh, somehow separated from uh, big Russia. Uh, but I would like also to stress a couple of uh, uh, good things which has happened uh, during, uh, during this terrible war, I mean, during this period that such. First of all, of, co of, all, of course, it's a unity which we have showed within Europe, Europe, within European Union, and also transatlantic unity, I mean, together with, uh, with, uh, with the United States, Canada, and of course our partners in, uh, in East, uh, Japan, uh, South Korea, and Australia. And, and other thing I think is that, uh, uh, that's, that shows also that we have been able to show our common attitude to Russia. So, which I think is very important, I mean, not only regarding the war today uh, in Ukraine, but also for the future consequences. Thank you for that, and I'm especially glad you emphasized the point about uh, unity. You did as well. And I say that because in response to Mary, your question, and looking at the state of the State Department, that's why I did want to highlight, I know there are those of you in this audience know the importance of diplomacy, and in that sense, the State Department also, and our Secretary of State, and all of the colleagues there have worked very hard in, in terms of trying to bring together that unity of purpose throughout uh, not only just Europe, but also globally in response to the invasion of Ukraine. Ambassador, please. Christian. Th thank you so much, and uh, it's a distinct honor uh, to have this opportunity uh, with my colleagues to to, uh, to be here today. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, and uh, all, the, all the gratitude also to uh, World Boston. Uh, the uh, European security situation, uh, I would, I would uh, describe it with one word. It's tense. After all, we are at the 
uh, most serious uh, crossroads that uh, European, Europe has faced in terms of security since the uh, Second, Second World War. The, the, the kind of challenge that, uh, that Russia has uh, posed to the entire transatlantic uh, security architecture uh, with its uh, aggression against uh, Ukraine is both in terms of uh, depth as well as uh, in width uh, uh, something that we haven't seen uh, since, since the Second World War. This is the reason why, uh, why we believe that, uh, that the end, end game or end solution of this war has to be uh, something that uh, thoroughly discredits the uh, aggression as a tool and uh, guarantees that uh, at least for the uh, generation or two there won't be anyone uh, trying to use the same uh, same tool and as just as my my colleagues mentioned there is a silver lining there the uh, the the way we've seen that uh, the west has actually stuck together uh, the way uh, U.S. administration uh, has uh, done admirable job in uh, in uh, uh, building the coalition and maintaining the, uh, the coalition uh, to resist and uh, and help uh, Ukraine uh, against this aggression is uh, uh, is unique and uh, and certainly a textbook case for the future. Now we're going to have a round of individual questions. Um, I would like to start with you, Christian. Uh, there was a report from the Estonian Intelligence Service stating that Russia presents a credible threat to the Baltic states. I know there was some speculation uh, earlier uh, about whether or not uh, there would be aggression against one of the Baltic states. How do you interpret this uh, <clears throat> this uh, statement that was released, and are you concerned about direct aggression at this time, meaning military aggression? Uh, thank you uh, for this question. Uh, just to put this um, uh, uh, question and this report into context, the context uh, of this report was uh, was the understanding that uh, that even with uh, with uh, Russian uh, ground forces seriously being decimated in in Ukraine, uh, firstly uh, the the Russian air force and particularly the navy has uh, uh, and, and certainly not in our region has not uh, suffered uh, uh, huge losses. Also, uh, when it comes to the uh, to the uh, Russian uh, manpower and uh, uh, equipment uh, of their uh, ground forces, uh, they, uh, in our view, will be able to, to bounce back and bounce back uh, quicker than uh, many would, uh, uh, would hope. Uh, this, in combination with the understanding that, uh, that Russia considers uh, for uh, military logistical uh, and uh, geopolitical reasons, uh, the Baltic uh, Baltic area as the most vulnerable of uh, uh, of uh, of NATO, and uh, and has prioritized the uh, Western uh, its own Western uh, uh, military direction over any other direction, uh, has resulted in an assessment whereby uh, Russia uh, is uh, uh, capable of. Uh, challenging uh, uh, NATO in the uh, Baltic area in two to four years. This does not mean that we expect them to do it. If the uh, NATO deterrence and defense uh, position is uh, solid, if they consider it credible, then uh, uh, I th we are all uh, safe. Thank you very much for putting it in context, and your, your comments are most interesting on this. Um, Morris, I want to ask you a question about China. Morris, if you notice in his bio, he served as ambassador, Latvia's ambassador to China. So in terms of threats, uh, would you comment on uh, the uh, Chinese challenge and threat uh, to the Baltic region and to Europe as a whole? And the situation in Ukraine. I'm going to put all three together for you. You could take it in which direction you'd like to. Uh, well, uh, when but I you're was... an expert on China. No, well, that was three years, no, four years, <laughs> almost four years ago. So, but 
uh, when I was serving in China, I always uh, was telling our Chinese friends that we are almost neighbors because it's only one country in between. <laughs> it's, uh, it happens to be a very big one, so I mean, largest in the world, but. Uh, but but that's that's what we have to take also into consideration. So China always tries to say that they they are very equally looking. I mean, so the size size doesn't matter for them. So it's a, if it's a big country, their attitude is the same as to, towards the small ones. So I mean, very unfortunately, I mean that China is sitting on a fence at the moment regarding Ukraine. And, and uh, looking, I mean, uh, somewhere in the glass or uh, crystal ball, I mean, what will happen in, in uh, months or in weeks, so which side they, they will have to take. Uh, politically, uh, I would say we all can agree that they are supporting uh, Russia. Uh, militarily, I hope that they are not supporting Russia and probably will, uh, let's hope that they will not do that, so that's... That will be uh, not the best turn uh, regarding uh, war, war, in war in Ukraine. So it's enough that North Korea is doing something, uh, helping Russia with uh, with uh, military uh, assistance. But but yes, it's uh, it's fascinating that uh, one of the actually one of the member of uh, United Nations Security Council is attacking uh, you know uh, sovereign country. And another member is actually, actually just looking and waiting what will happen. So if, if China would take a position that, you know, saying that uh, territorial integrity of Ukraine is important, as they did it before regarding Crimea, then I think the situation probably uh, international also could be a little bit different. So probably more positive to, towards Ukraine. All right. Well, thank you for that. Audra, if you want to comment on China, because Lithuania did go toe-to-toe -to -toe with China over the issue of Taiwan, if you want to make a comment. But I want to especially ask you about Belarus and what's happening there, because also Lithuania has been very generous in taking in refugees from Belarus. Uh, speak to that issue. Uh, I think your country has been very engaged there. Um. With Belarus, we have longest, our longest land border is with Belarus. So it's been a, a, a neighbor for, for centuries. Some even uh, common state, but now the, the, the last register. So we always followed very closely what's happening in Belarus and try to, to help as possible. Unfortunately, maybe I won't go to, too long into the history, I mean, what happened after the last elections and uh, the people uh, protested uh, the forged results and we had to host many refugees from uh, Belarus as well. We continue and Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya, who, who got like elected uh, or leader of the of, uh, democratic Belarus. But what's uh, now what we witnessed during the last years really worrying and frightening. Russia technically swallowed whatever uh, Belarus or whatever word can be used, but they would, we saw they used Belarus territory for the full-scale military invasion to Ukraine. So they could use it, now they're using its territory for training, they have military bases and exercises been already for, for some a while. So technically the NATO-Russia border moved to the east, to the Lithuanian-Belarus or Polish-Belarus uh, border. So in, uh, I think in this new environment, NATO and uh, and all the Western countries has to also say and to, to really acknowledge that. All right. We're going to have one last round here and then going to all of you. Um, my last question, is, we're going to start with you, Morris, and that is, he's chuckling, um, because I, I want to ask him the question about differences. You know, the question always comes up, is there always a unity of purpose among the Baltic states? You know, where are there differences? But I'm going to have A and B. So what are the differences among uh, you, all of you, but are there also differences at this time that you have in contrast to U.S. interests and security? goals. 
Well, we had this uh, this question in our previous discussion, and my colleagues were the Harvard trying. students asked this question. Yeah, and, so not them. <laughs> and my colleagues, uh, Lithuanian and Estonian colleagues, were trying to find the differences, you know, food and language. So, uh, so that's okay. I will probably go back a little bit to the history, as, into the history as well, and will say that. Uh, so language-wise, we are more closer with Lithuania, very close. Uh, that's a one, one Baltic language uh, group, I mean, where we belong. But historically, we are much closer working together with Estonians. So that's, you know, there is uh, differences and similarities. Um, so, uh, but as I said, I mean, in, the Harvard, in uh, Harvard University, I think that uh, we have more more things uniting us and probably uh, having differences. So it's, of course, we are three independent and uh, countries with a different uh, ways of uh, organizing probably our democracies so, uh, and, and uh, economies and ways how to go forward, sometimes uh, not so easy, sometimes difficult, sometimes much easier. So, but I think that in general, especially looking in today's situation in Europe, I think we are very united. So it's are, uh, especially regarding uh, forward. Uh, are, to, uh, are there Ukraine. any issues which you diverge with the United States at this time? You know, uh, United States, uh, well, if we look and we had the shortly discussion, probably we will have discussion regarding accountability. I think that's, that's probably the difference. Uh, I would say that regarding uh, international tribunal for, for uh, crime of aggression, so that at the moment, U.S. has taken position which probably doesn't, uh, well, we would like to have a different solution. So, and we hope that the United States will probably change this attitude or will go towards uh, international tribunal, which is uh, why the United Nations not uh, taking this national uh, way or uh, hybrid way. So that's, but otherwise, I think we are very united also with the United States. All right, thank you for that. Audra, let's go to you next and then Christian. Please. Yeah, it's, it's not easy to find differences, or <laughs> because especially on foreign policy, or uh, or when we work as diplomats, uh, we mentioned before as well, our closest always colleagues are Latvians, Estonians. We always go to each other to consult. We have lunches, dinners, or something, comparing the notes, and uh, or, or sometimes also sharing work because we usually have small missions and so uh, small embassies so we cannot have everything so we why don't you do that i will do that or something like that because usually we're really like-minded but now i can be also the tourist agent a little bit in general if you go to our countries we're different because of history because of culture because of religion if lithuania was always more with the uh, Central Europe, we had Commonwealth with, uh, with Poland, we had uh, our Grand Duchy with uh, even some our castles now in Belarus or, or Ukraine, you can find some Lithuania or something like that. So our was, uh, attention to that. Uh, Latvians, Estonians were more with Germans, Swedes, in Nordic. So if you come today to our countries, you could see, please, it's very small countries, very nice, it's very easy to travel. And in such small, especially for Americans, small uh, area, you could find three different countries, three different actually. If Lithuania is more Baroque, it's more Central European country. Latvians is definitely Hansa city, is uh, German. Uh, Tallinn is very bit Nordic, so and it's uh, our cuisine and everything. So I think it's it's one of the best destinations in Europe. So. Please. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Christian, are you going to one up here? <laughs> oh, yeah, the whatever uh, uh, my, my uh, two colleagues have just stated, uh, I only can agree, agree with. Uh, uh, so, welcome to the Baltics. Uh, uh, as far as the poli uh, policy positions go, uh, then. Uh, uh, for sure, uh, we we are very much on the same page, and not only during this uh, particular uh, uh, juncture of European history, but uh, it's been uh, it's been for for decades. So that uh, the national security and defence are the issues where where we are uh, very close to each other. The uh, defen uh, Baltic defence cooperation is certainly uh, the area where the integration is the deepest, and and uh, and uh, I would also say that the ambition has always been 
the ambition has all, uh, also been uh, uh, the, the deepest or, or uh, more for, forward leaning. Well, when it comes to, uh, let's say, softer issues and uh, particularly uh, economic issues, then we can also see a bit more uh, competition there. But it, it's very, very natural. Uh, natural, I guess. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, sometimes uh, different economic sectors that uh, that uh, may compete with each other and so on and so forth. So, for example, uh, uh, like 15 years ago, there was a very active plan to to build uh, uh, as a, com a common or joint project the nuclear power plant, uh, then uh, our, our uh, nations and our governments had different ideas, so it never ca came about. Uh, we also have been uh, uh, dealing with uh, a, co a joint project or common project of uh, uh, the rail line that goes through our, our countries. I think we are getting there, but we, we have had different differences of, of opinions there too. But this is, uh, these are the uh, differences that are uh, minor compared with any, any, anything that normally uh, neighboring or, and competing economies uh, uh, would have. So I'm very happy to have uh, uh, colleagues like Maris and uh, Audra uh, that I can uh, work with. As far as the issue, issues with the US uh, uh, are concerned, I would not go into the actual uh, particular files, but, I, but I, I would just point out that when it comes to the uh, national defense and security issues that, uh, that we are uh, particularly uh, uh, concerned of, then uh, uh, for us, for example, the, uh, the uh, Russian invasion against uh, Ukraine is uh, close to existential. We, we feel that uh, the uh, end result of this uh, conflict uh, may uh, uh, carry existential consequences also to our, our, our own nations. Whereas for, for the US, uh, that is uh, separated from Europe uh, uh, by an ocean, uh, and uh, and that has global interests everywhere. Uh, this conflict is certainly not felt exactly the same way. However, I, w I would argue that uh, that this uh, uh, U.S. administration uh, uh, considers this uh, as something that is definitely not a uh, territorial dispute between uh, uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine has. Uh, 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 some have, have argued, but but the U.S. also understands that uh, that uh, this uh, uh, particular conflict is is very much about uh, its own global vital interests. But there are nuances there. But of course, for us, uh, the skin is closer to the game right now. Thank you for that, and I think the unity of purpose, strong unity mm -hmm. of purpose among the th three countries, your countries, has really made a big difference in that regard. I'd like to invite uh, Mary back up here because we really want to have a huge chunk of time where you get a chance to pose questions. There were many more questions I could have asked, and I'm hoping you asked. So over to you, uh, Mary. Uh, Thank you. Uh, but actually, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that the I'm first question. The <laughs> Mike, um, I'm wondering um, uh, about uh, in your and in, in very different proportions uh, between Lithuania and Latvia and Estonia, um, Russian-speaking uh, citizens and residents uh, can seem to be very um, vulnerable, according to uh, Russian authorities. Uh, so I'm wondering if you can talk about uh, how Russian speakers have integrated into your country since the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991, and um, given the invasion, how, uh, how they are faring now and how your governments are interacting with them. Christian, would you like to go first? Yeah, why not? Uh, yes, in, in Estonia we, we do have a, a, a large share of our population that uh, it's important to have a right term here, whose uh, uh, mother language is not Estonian and, uh, and uh, most often their uh, preferred first language is, is Russian. Now, one has to understand that, uh, that Estonia has had a, a, a traditional, quite large uh, Russian-speaking population that was uh, actually the, 
the uh, initially the uh, sort of byproduct of uh, Burgess uh, by by the uh, Russian Tsar Peter the Great when they uh, he basically expelled part of uh, you know cert certain group uh, group of people from his country they uh, found refuge in Estonia. But uh, mostly this uh, uh, Russian-speaking population in Estonia uh, uh, were settled in Estonia during the uh, occupation by the Soviet Union. Now, uh, the, uh, the percentage of population, uh, this population is close to 23, 24%. Now, what, what we have to understand again here is that, uh, that uh, quite often uh, they just want to be seen as, you know, Esto Estonians or Est Estonian uh, citizens and Estonian uh, residents who happen to have a different, uh, different uh, language background, but who are just similar to any other Estonian. Whereas uh, Vladimir Putin and uh, his regime, and actually even even uh, the Russian, uh, uh, Russian, uh, you know, Yeltsin regime before that. Uh, often try to use these people uh, kind of for instigating uh, uh, instigating uh, uh, troubles uh, within the Estonian society and creating creating uh, creating problems. We feel that uh, uh, more often than not, uh, these people are are just uh, average Estonian uh, people. They they go to Estonian schools. They 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 work in Estonia. They, uh, they often travel in other places of, uh, over the European Union because the working and studying is all you know, open, open for them. So, so I would say that they are uh, relatively well uh, integrated to the, uh, uh, to the larger Estonian society, uh, but, uh, but uh, qu uh, quite often the, uh, the Russian propaganda tries to portray them as the agents of, uh, you know, uh, this Russian mirror or Ruski mirror or Russian world as they, but uh, normally these people are just, they know what, how it is to live in, in Russia because they have relatives there. They know what are the benefits of living actually in, uh, in a European Union country. They, they may say th certain things about the greatness of Russia, but mostly so before the, uh, this war started. But then again, they prefer to live in the European Union because the living standards are better, the education is better, the, the uh, medical care is better, the, the pensions are better, and so on and so forth. Sorry for a long, long answer, but... No, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's rather detailed. Please, Morris, you yeah, should I, next. I, I will jump in. Uh, so if you change Estonia with the name Latvia, I think probably the answer would be uh, almost, almost the same. Similar proportion. So similar Russian proportion. Speakers. It's about 24%, 24 and those are ethnic Russians. Uh, just uh, just to uh, couple, uh, say a couple of points, probably more is uh, I would say that its uh, integration has been uh, quite good as well. Uh, we cannot say, I think, that that was a Germany who said that integration wasn't very successful in Germany regarding a uh, population from the uh, south. Uh, uh, I think I can agree to all the points that uh, Christian mentioned regarding, uh, you know, living standards, which are much better, of course. I mean, we can always wish to be even better, so, but much better than in Russia. Uh, so that it's, uh, but uh, just just to say, and historically there has been always Russian population, ethnic Russian population in Latvia, so it's nothing new. Of course, during the Soviet Soviet occupation time, there were uh, those forcibly, I mean, those Russians who arrived, and especially military personnel, because we had a large military district in, in, uh, in, in Latvia, which was covering all the Baltics. But I would say uh, that uh, very unfortunately, I mean, or fortunately for us, uh, the terrible war in Ukraine, actually managed to kill two things. COVID, which was one, actually, it's, which dis didn't disappear, but we are not speaking so much, and also also minority issues, at least in Latvia. So, of course, Russia, from time to time, is raising the question, but it doesn't have any relevance anymore because of what they are doing in Ukraine. Okay, and the situation in Lithuania is rather different in terms of population. Yeah, we have much less 
minorities uh, or the probably Polish minorities bigger than uh, than Russian minorities is also traditionally lived people so they since the very beginning they had a Lithuanian citizen and were integrated how many of them would been listening to Russian television, Russian propaganda, there's still a question. I think in all our countries there are some percentage which follows more, how to say, not mainstream, but uh, some strange media channels and, and, and belief. And so disinformation, misinformation works, unfortunately, in every country, but uh, I think it's completely integrated and it's, it's a big, anyways, in our region, so minorities, not minorities, but uh, support to Ukraine is enormous and it's just strengthened the society, the, got it united, and it's not our, our governments or, or political elites support that, but the whole society supports Ukrainians and it's war because we feel that it's an existential war for us as well. Thank you very much. All right, so I'm um, going to see a lot of hands. Yes, on the end there in the white sweater, sir. Yep, yeah, go ahead. We've got mics that are coming down and, um, okay. All right, excellent. Uh, thank you all so much for uh, giving us the opportunity to you know, learn more about your uh, different countries that you represent. Um, I actually wanted to sort of si switch gears just a little bit to ask a question about sort of like the Baltic state position on uh, cyberspace. Um, I myself, I focus quite um, uh, a lot on the issue of cyberspace and it is sort of, it has uh, security implications. Um, and I know the Baltic states have also taken uh, quite a very, um, uh, a good stance on the issue of um, tech and e-government in particular, Ambassador Prik, um, you, you know that, um, with Estonia as well. Um, right now, the intergovernmental process and the Global Digital Compact is ongoing at the UN. And I know right now there's a lot of talk across different um, countries about where they sort of stand in regard to the issue of cyberspace. So I just wanted to ask the question about how each of your, uh, from each of your different positions, what your sort of idea is on um, okay. the role of international soft law. In, Mary, um, I hope you don't mind my great. jumping in. Could you introduce yourself so oh, we all yeah. know who you are? Absolutely, uh, Brandon Sullivan. I'm a master's student at UMass Boston, incoming PhD at BU. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone in particular? Christian, you should really take it. Uh, you know, Russia had a cyber attack on, on Estonia, and you really changed a lot as a result of it. Do you want to? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for uh, pointing out this uh, critical domain that, uh, that we all benefit from uh, and that uh, uh, and that uh, influences us all uh, in good and bad. Uh, I'm not an uh, expert of uh, uh, international law myself, but, uh, uh, but uh, we in Estonia, we have uh, take, clearly taken the approach that uh, when it comes to uh, cyber security and cyberspace in general, uh, the security part should not be a, an afterthought or add-on but this uh, should be uh, something that uh, is in the core of uh, of developing uh, different uh, uh, you know applications uh, solutions and the whole ecosystem uh, as far as the uh, uh, the international law uh, uh, is uh, uh, concerned we feel that uh, as much as possible we should not uh, treat the uh, uh, cyberspace as completely new phenomenon uh, or, or uh, create completely new uh, law, but rather uh, try to apply the same logic that, uh, that is in use in other domains, also when, uh, when dealing with uh, 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 cyberspace, including the, you know, the re responsibility, including the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, you know, dif different ways how the different actors uh, should be uh, act there. So uh, I don't know whether this answers to your question, but yeah, thank you. Okay, do you want to jump uh, I in? I will just add, I mean, so that it's, uh, that cyber attacks, that's, uh, you know, happening every day. 
uh, it's the same in Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia, and I guess also in other countries as well, so that we have to do everything. I mean, and Estonia was, uh, of course, uh, the first example when our neighbor, uh, eastern neighbor, managed actually to attack uh, in that uh, area. Uh, but I think that you have, I think we are quite, uh, we have learned a lot, I think, at least in our part. But I think that you have noticed also the same in the United States, so colonial pipeline, I think, was a very good example. Uh, so which happened, what was it, in 2020? So that when, uh, you know, you couldn't get, uh, let's say, fuel, I mean, so actually it shows that you just need, you know, one small attack. Uh, to one one particular uh, you know site, let's say, and actually you can destroy you know everyday life for uh, quite a long period. You succeeded, of course. I mean, and we all succeed, but I think that's an area where we have to uh, be quite uh, careful. Great, thank you. Uh, should we go on or? No, you mentioned that United Nations, so I think there are two two ways, and clearly we are like-minded with the U.S. as well. I mean, I mean, we have to ensure, because that's the beginning of international law in that area, and we have to ensure that we are on the right track, that we protect that area, but also allow to develop and... Great, okay, sometimes. so keep those hands up there. Um, I'm gonna go around to different parts of the room. Okay, Raul, right in the middle there. Thank you, Raul Alcala. My question is about NATO and NATO expansion and uh, your views on assuaging your concerns. So Finland is about to become a member of the alliance. Sweden may be close behind. Does this help reduce some of the pressure you feel from Russia and the East? Or would you prefer still to have some forward deployed troops from other NATO countries in your countries? Thank you. Jump in. Well, <laughs> Jump right in. I mean, you almost gave an answer, I mean, so to your question. Uh, I think uh, all, all, all Baltic countries and neighborhood in general is very, uh, you know, happy that Sweden and Finland gave up their neutrality. Sweden, I think, gave up neutrality, which is 200 years plus. You can always discuss and uh, how neutral was Sweden during the Second World War, but that's another issue. But but uh, but at least, you know, we are saying now that the Baltic Sea will become a Baltic, uh, I mean, NATO lake. So, which is, uh, for us, uh, for the Baltics, it's a very important issue geographically. I mean, regionally, I think that's important. And as that shows that Putin's politics actually has failed in that part because he saw that, uh, or he was complaining that NATO is uh, enlarging and, uh, you know, and surrounding NATO countries, surrounding Russia, so he managed to get two more. And I do hope that in future our Ukrainian friends also become members and the same goes for, for Georgia, so that, and, uh, so that NATO will become more, uh, more, 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 uh, I mean, larger and uh, much better security organization. If, if I may, because you're uh, Vilnius, yeah. there's yeah. the NATO summit in Vilnius in July, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, just on the second part of your question. So we were very happy that uh, Finland, I think, tomorrow officially becomes a member of NATO, if I'm not mistaken. And we do hope that in Vilnius summit, we will have another new member state, Sweden. So of course, it depends on the ratification on, on uh, still two countries uh, at that. But, but still, for real deterrence and defense, we would like to have NATO presence in our states. We are working in our case in Lithuania, there is a German led battalion, Canada and the UK is uh, for, for Latvian Estonians and working with them countries and also all the, our NATO allies to strengthen that presence because we think only to the best deterrence is the good defense to prepare for the defense. So the, the NATO battalions, we want them to become the brigade, and so also US military troops on the ground. We do have now full-fledged combat ready US battalion in Lithuania, so, and we see that as the best, the best deterrence as well, so. Christian, do you have a comment, or do we go to the next question? I'm I, hesitating because you lived right across the border from Finland. 
in this case, and I know that you have also a special tie in that regard. I would only say two sentences. Two sentences. Uh, no, uh, no country has applied for uh, for a NATO membership uh, uh, because they have felt the surplus of security. <laughs> and neither is this the case in the uh, in the case of Finland or Sweden. Okay, lots of questions. All right, uh, Maya, go, go right ahead. Do we have? Here comes the mic. Thanks. I'm Maya Cross, Professor of Political Science and Director of the Center for International Affairs at Northeastern. My question is about your membership in the EU. Um, as most of us know, France and Germany have really been the engine of integration behind security and security policy in the EU. Is it your sense, though, with Russia's invasion that the center of gravity in security terms is kind of shifting to the east and the north? Um, in that perspective. Thanks. Audra. <laughs> She's smiling <laughs> on this question, all right? <laughs> probably. Maybe it's too early to say, but we see that probably now the eastern flank countries of the EU probably more has to say. And when we see how Poland is preparing militarily all that, so soon probably they will have one of the strongest, if it's not the strongest army in, in Europe. So that that would be a, a, some shift as well. But. But it's the best thing, it's very good that EU and NATO, they speak one voice, which is regards to the security. I think that's, that's the main uh, achievement and uh, the best result. So probably one, we sometimes we disagree on uh, or, or some ways or some methods or something like that. But I think the understandings in, in Europe and transatlantic area is really the same and that's very important. I have to, I think, rely on that and move forward. And who would be leading or something, it's, we'll see. Anyone? But it may be just, or oh, Germans was really uh, essential shifts as well, what we saw the last year. I mean, that they are giving weapons and uh, ammunition and now tanks to Ukraine and everything and, and leading and now having commitments to increase their defense. I think it's it's very essential and important for the whole Europe. Yeah, but I, I would tend to agree with you because regarding European Union, so that it's, uh, I would say that we have to point out Poland, so that it's uh, becoming, uh, uh, I mean, really for us regionally, regionally for us, I mean, uh, what Audrey mentioned regarding defense and security issues, but also, also playing a more and more uh, important role also within European Union. And of course, Nordics in general, so that's, uh, that's has, uh, that group has never disappeared. We need only Norway to join European Union and Iceland, so then I think we'll, we'll, we will be complete. <laughs> Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I feel like I've been leaning on this side of the room, but uh, sir in the red. Thank you. So uh, my name is Ramiz Bistras. I'm uh, CEO of uh, Darasis Therapeutics doing bi biotech. My question is um, about Baltic countries. What Baltic countries are doing themselves in order to prepare for potential Russian Russian. The war is going in Ukraine already for one year. Obviously, we learned lessons from that. And uh, as Ambassador mentioned, Russia swallowed uh, uh, Belarus and borders already moved during yep. one year. So what are you doing themselves you know, in order to prepare and defend country and not rely only on NATO and um, as one of the NATO commanders uh, observed recently, it will be hard to convince uh, Germans, Canadians, or Americans to sit in the trenches in Suwalki, where not so many Lithuanians mm -hmm. or okay. Estonians or Latvians will be around. Great, thank you. Christian, do you want to take it first? Yes, uh, thank you for this question. Uh, we certainly 
have not uh, uh, woken up only after uh, uh, Russia uh, invaded uh, full scale uh, Ukraine uh, last last year. Estonia is an incredibly not, uh, my colleagues don't uh, allow me to say small country, so Estonia is a very compact country. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we only have 1.3 million people. So, uh, but at the same time we have the territory of, uh, uh, we have a territory that is uh, larger than uh, the territory of uh, uh, Netherlands. And they have more than 15 million people. So we have a challenge how to defend this, uh, uh, this territory. And in our own defense uh, doctrine, of course, for, first, first and, and the most important pillar is our own initial self-defense. We are not asking the Americans, the French, the Icelanders, or whoever, to defend ourselves before we do uh, it ourselves. So how do we square this uh, circle? Is this the right, right term? So uh, as unconventional as it may be, we have never done away with the uh, conscription. Est Estonia, Estonia uh, uh, maintains and will maintain national service. I'm a reservist. I, I've, I've, uh, uh, I've served in our military as a, as a conscript. I'm an officer in reserve. I, I go uh, to annual ref refreshment trainings. So I'm part of, part of the reserve. And, uh, and uh, uh, this is not just uh, uh, you know, thousands upon thousands of men and, and women, but this is uh, a reserve that is trained, that is, uh, uh, that, uh, that is equipped with uh, modern uh, weaponry, that has stocks, which is not that common uh, in these, this world, uh, and that uh, where and our government actually spends for defense, just like my, my neighbors. Our uh, defense spending this year is approximately at 3% uh, of GDP level. Next year it's going to be 3.2%. And very importantly, 50% of this, invest, uh, th this money spent actually goes to defense investments. So we are, uh, we are militaries th that have actual capability rather than just uh, you know, the army for parades. Well, uh, I will probably, uh, regarding spending, I mean, we are in, uh, on similar grounds, uh, all three countries, uh, so uh, we do fulfill NATO criteria. Uh, well, probably, you know, we have had the professional army uh, that was a little bit different from our neighbors, but because of war in Ukraine, so we are going back to conscription as well, so slowly introducing it back, so that there are some changes. So, and the rest of the regarding spending and uh, military equipment, uh, I mean, I can only assign what, uh, what uh, Christian said. I think Audra has a brief question, uh, no, brief the, answer, excuse me. Just as well, the, the, the spending also one of the highest in, uh, in the NATO countries, the same uh, on that, so we are far up from the 2%. All the trying to, uh, to buy all the military equipment, unfortunately, of the production worldwide is not so easy, even if you have money, so another thing. Uh, we have professional army, which been already working in very hot, points of well with the US Army like special our operation forces or in uh, Afghanistan or, or or some other parts so they were really well trained conscript army as well we introduced some years ago and to be very frank there's not even there are some volunteers who are joining that we don't need to, to draft or so so they are also all the voluntary groups who are training to be, so it's really for, the, and now with the war in Ukraine, people are preparing for self-defense if it's needed, and we know that, I mean, if something will be, there will be stay to fight. So Mary, I happen. note that it's uh, seven o'clock, and I don't know if we could do no, one, we have a, a one couple, or two more. Time for maybe a couple more, but um, we do okay, have uh, some people patiently, or a person uh, patiently waiting on Zoom, so Natalie will read the question. Oh, great. Uh, thank you, everyone. Am I on? No? Oh, I think I'm on now. Yes. We can, we okay. can hear you. <laughs> um, I'm reading a question from Zoom from Sebastian Spurinu. Is the idea historically of an intermarium or a political economic union being given any consideration right now? A political union. 
Among the Baltics, does, does he say? Yeah, so just within the Baltics. I think with the European Union, we more or less have that already uh, integration as well when we have uh, common uh, zone that's, and that's the that's same currency. That's very answer, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that was my reaction yeah, immediately. But but you said currency, was there another... no borders or something, so we are so well was integrated. Was there another in Zoom question? Is there anyone else teed up, up on Zoom that you want to go to, or shall we go back to the room? All right, we'll go back to the room, and uh, you know, maybe we should take two at once. Um, that would and be great. Only, only a couple of I people think that would be answer, great. Uh, so that we can. Uh, okay, uh, Barkev may come right on down, um, and then you can pass the mic back when you're uh, done with your question, and then we'll go to Wing Kai and do two so questions. So my name is Martin, and I'm a uh, retired oh, uh, oh, army sorry. officer. Okay. And uh, my question right. is, what concerns do uh, panelists have regarding the strength of American public support for mm. Ukraine? Great, good question. And then, uh, oh, okay. All right, we'll go. We'll go to you, Barkov. Go ahead. We'll do these two. Okay. No, 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 we're going to take two at once. So jump in. Well, mine is going to be quite a bit different. Okay. I come from that generation that appreciates what Russia did to save this world from German domination. I saw how the Serbs and the Greeks were the only ones that fought the Germans, even after they were occupied by things. And because of that, they held up the invasion of the Soviet Union by two months. And after that, even when the Germans came in, Ukrainians, most of them surrendered to the Germans because okay. they, they welcomed them. So everything was left on the Serbs, the Greeks, and the Russians. The Russians was, lost over 24 million people. Now, everybody seems to forget this. And, and what question is that bringing to your well, mind? Well, my question is going to be, do you consider these things? The fact that NATO itself, you're worshipping NATO. NATO was the one that created this situation. Think okay. of that. that that's all I'm asking. That's, Have you that's, thought about that? Many people Why think did this about happen? That. Thank you. Okay, so we've got two questions here uh, about U.S. Uh, public opinion, if, to summarize. And then... Um, uh, a question the, just the about NATO, NATO and guess, NATO enlargement. Say. So how shall we sort this? Who wants to begin? Well, Morris, as, uh, jump in. <laughs> as historian, I would say that probably it's not only 24 million. I mean, it's probably 27 or even plus, maybe more, up to 50 million. But Soviet Union lost. It's not only Russia, but it was Soviet Union. So it included also Ukrainians. So that's regarding Second World War. I mean, and then we are not speaking about those atro atrocities, actually, what Soviet Union did in Germany and in other places when they just, you know, March to uh, Berlin and then back. So because they were, that was a victory. I mean, that was those were winners and they were not uh, judged for that. Now we are looking for, you know, accountability. Actually, what they are doing exactly the same in Ukraine. Uh, yeah, I will stop here. So. <laughs> Audra. And then Christian. So, well, Go, just please. just to add, please. sorry, sorry, sorry. About I mean, the American NATO opinion. was not NATO yeah. was not attacking Ukraine, so I don't see that. Probably goes to be very honest, more to what our Russian colleagues uh, in their propaganda is saying. I mean that that was. Do Do okay. you have an answer? Then we can we can discuss Ma this afterwards. Morris, do you have a, a comment on the American public opinion? The three of you are ambassadors to the United States. Just how do you see that? Well, I would probably, uh, if I can continue, I would say that uh, I have been the same as Christian. I mean, three times here. I have been in the United States two times. So I have, of course, we do follow election circles. I mean, I would personally say that I know that I can say that, and you have to correct me if I'm wrong. So your elections are never about foreign policy. I'm not saying that it's not, not a topic. Of course, it's a topic so, uh, and it's an issue, but you are more looking, and if you look CNN or Fox News, then it's, you know, it's economy, you know, uh, I mean, abortion, you know, different other issues. And then there is foreign policy, number five, number six, number seven, depends. And that is the reason why I'm always saying, you know, and then you have to look to the Congress, and that's what we are working with your representatives and with your senators, because those are those people who actually, you know, bring this foreign policy actually towards 
let's say, outside world. So in this case, I do believe that uh, if Republican Party and Democrat Party is saying that there is support for Ukraine and we are continuing support, so I believe that that support will stay as long as it is necessary. Audra? Maybe the, very briefly. I mean, we were so grateful for the U.S. support during our occupation because we knew that U.S. would support a never recognized occupation of Lithuania and the U.S. standing for us and you would stand. So that gave us hope. And we are very grateful now for the U.S. for the support to Ukraine. I mean, it's amazing how the U.S. public and society supported that. And not only administration and uh, President Biden, who I mean, it, it, almost a miracle how they forged the, the global coalition to support Ukraine in such a, a short period of time. So, and uh, we do hope that would uh, remain and uh, would be there. Christian. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, regarding the uh, U.S. Uh, public support, I have uh, 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 concerns uh, from two angles. Uh, first is uh, that uh, quite often uh, it seems to be uh, difficult to understand the, again, the U.S. vital interests that, that are related to uh, this uh, uh, war going on, both in terms of uh, what kind of lessons will be learned from uh, from. Uh, uh, the outcomes of the, uh, this, uh, this war, and secondly, also uh, regarding the the role of uh, uh, partners and uh, uh, European partners and allies after this war is over, but other global challenges uh, still remain. Uh, and second angle is uh, is the uh, uh, the fact that uh, for some reason, uh, really. A uh, big part of American uh, uh, public seems to believe that uh, uh, it's uh, uh, just about the U.S. support that has been given to, to Ukraine and uh, other uh, global partners, including Europeans and particularly Europeans, have uh, not done any, anything or, or pretty much so. In fact, uh, this is not the case. For example, our three countries are uh, uh, are uh, leading in different uh, different rankings when it comes to uh, uh, military aid uh, given to Ukraine per capita. Also, uh, refugees uh, uh, received in our countries per capita. Estonian population has increased more than 5%. Could you imagine, uh, because of refugees, could you Im imagine some 16 million uh, refugees coming in in just one, one year here? And also in terms of um, uh, military training for, U uh, for uh, Ukrainian uh, soldiers per capita. And this is not, uh, and we are con our countries are not isolated cases, but actually the Euro uh, European story is pretty good. And uh, uh, very shortly on the, on the second uh, uh, topic, I mean, uh, we, ha we have to uh, remember and understand that uh, Second World War was only uh, started after uh, uh, Nazi Germany and Soviet Union concluded uh, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Second World War started when uh, uh, Nazi Germany uh, uh, invaded Poland and, uh, and the Soviet Union uh, in unison uh, invaded uh, Poland uh, uh, from the east. My own nation uh, due to the uh, due to the effects of Second World War, uh, ended up losing 20% of our population, uh, and mostly uh, due to uh, Soviet terror. Terror, and my 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 uh, my nation's historic uh, experience is that since the mid 11th century, we've uh, experienced around 70 invasion from uh, from uh, current day, current day Re Russia so our historic memory is very different not only uh, regarding the second world war but also uh, 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 regarding the times well before the second world war and i believe your former president <laughs> i believe your former president martlar I, I remember was, if I'm correct in saying this, was um, in the Gulag. Uh, there were many who spoke about their time in Siberia in the Gulag. Sorry. Uh, our 
Mark Lahr was too young for that, but for our former president, Leonard, Leonard Mary, yes, uh, was, uh, was sent to Siberia, just as was uh, the six-month-old mother of our current uh, prime minister. She was uh, deported to Siberia uh, together with uh, uh, her mother and grand grandmother when she was six months uh, old in 1949. So the... Europe may have been in peace technically, but for our nations, the Soviet terrors just continued uh, uh, up until the time Stalin ended in the most forceful, forceful manner. But even w when I grew up behind the Iron Curtain in, in the Soviet Union, I remember the, the, uh, the threat and terror of, of uh, Soviet regime. I remember when our uh, uh, school, school teachers told us that please don't mention certain things in loud voice because you and your family may have troubles. It was in the mid-1980s. Thank you. Wow. I th yes. I'm really sorry to say there's so many questions, but we also want some time for conversations. So I think we've come to the point where we should very much thank um, four ambassadors for being with us. So uh, thank you all for being with us. We're going to go upstairs um, with the speakers first, then please jo join us for a little bit of conversation. And to those of you who are on Zoom, um, thanks for being with us. And to everybody, we hope to see you here on Thursday for uh, climate migration. All right, thanks. <laughs>